Toxicroak, Regirock, and Articuno. What did these Pokemon have in common? Well, to put it bluntly, they're not good. Or at least, they weren't. And then they were. And then they weren't again. Yeah, as it turns out, what makes a Pokemon good or bad has a lot to do with stats and move pools and stuff, but there's one thing that can override all of these factors, and that's the other good Pokemon. Today we'll be taking a look at Pokemon that became good due to the conditions of the metagame that they existed in, or in a more catchy way, we'll be talking about some unexpected top tiers. Now, I'm going to be using top tiers loosely here. If a Pokemon can get consistent results in tournaments, I'm going to call it a top tier in my book. Fluttermane? Landorus? Never heard of them. This is a Crobat household. Anyways, let's get into that. And if you enjoyed this video at Amplay in Time and love competitive Pokemon content, be sure to leave a like and subscribe because I'm coming up on 100,000 subscribers real soon here. As a matter of fact, you might want to sub right now because I got a big playlist full of other competitive Pokemon discussion videos that you can check out right after this one. Anyways, let's get started. Now, Crobat is a Pokemon which has received nearly no changes outside of its move pool since it was created. Despite that, Crobat became a really powerful tool in VGC on a couple of occasions. Looking at its stats, it's got one thing that should really stand out to all of you. Crobat's got a 130 base speed stat and some really solid bulk across the board, and while Poison Flying isn't the super solid defensive typing, it's situationally great into many of the restricted threats that we see in GS Cup VGC formats. This is a format where restricted legendaries, your Groudons and Xerneases, not your Uxies and Regices, and as a matter of fact, not your Keldeo, so stop saying Keldeo's a legendary, it's mythical, I'm sorry, they become legal, and you're limited to two per team. Crobat is very specifically viable under these conditions. Being a poison flying type means it's capable of taking hits from plus two Geomancy Xerneas and being immune to Groudon's Precipice Blades. It also has tons of tools to take full advantage of this defensive niche. Not the least of these is Tailwind, which ironically it was one of the best non-prankster users of it before the dynamic speed mechanics were introduced in Generation 8, but it was able to quickly set up Tailwind for its partner and wasn't able to be flinched due to its ability Inner Focus. This ability means that Fake Out Incineroar couldn't prevent the Tailwind on turn one, and once Tailwind was up, it could use its other tools even more effectively to shut down other teams. These included Taunt to prevent Trick Room and Opposing Tailwind, Haze to clear the stats of Opposing Xerneas, and Super Fang to deal 50% of the opposing Pokemon's health and damage. This could be especially useful for instantly making Kyogre's Water Spout much weaker and getting opposing Pokemon into range of a KO. Crobat will likely return to this niche if it ever makes another appearance on a Switch era game. <laughs> Now, speaking of poison types in restricted formats, we need to talk about Toxicroak. Now, I'm gonna be real here. Toxicroak is outclassed in like 99% of formats by other fighting types, but once Kyogre comes around, this dude gets really thirsty. No, actually, Toxicroak's ability Dry Skin is like most of the reason it sees any use in competitive Pokemon. With 85 base speed and 106 base attack, it's not the fastest dude in the room, nor the strongest frog in the game. That honor goes to Heatran. Yes, Heatran is a frog, you can't change my mind. But Toxicroak's tools allow it to effectively counter Kyogre teams and restrict formats. By combining Dry Skin with Low Kick, Fake Out, Poison Jab, and Sucker Punch, this little guy can get some real work done. Dry Skin allows it to switch in on Water Spouts and Origin Pulses to regain a quarter of its health, while also healing 1 eighth each turn in the rain. This safe switch in makes it easier for Toxicroak to preserve a Focus Sash and then click Low Kick into the many heavy restricted Pokemon in the format. Low Kick's power is dependent on the target's weight, with it maxing out at 120 base power with no drawbacks if the opponent is 440.9 pounds or more. This absolutely does chunks to Kyogre, and its stab physical poison and move a poison jab allows for Toxicroak to really threaten Xerneas as well. Its only major flaw has to be how bad it does into Groudon matchups. Not only can Groudon easily one-shot Toxicroak with a ground move, but its high defense means it doesn't take as much from low kick, and the sun makes Toxicroak take one-eighth of its health and damage at the end of each turn if the sun is active. Despite all this though, the frog persists through the horrors, and I really respect that. <laughs> Guys, look, it's the squirrel. Guys, guys, strong Pokemon, weak Pokemon. These are the- I am Karen of the Elite Four. I love dark type Pokemon. I find their wild, tough image to be appealing. And they're so strong. See, the fictional character doesn't even really believe it. Yes, Pachirisu was actually a world champion and the prime example of a player using their favorite Pokemon to win. Or was it? Yeah, while Seijin may be a Pachirisu fan, there's, there's actually a specific purpose to Pachirisu on the team. It wasn't a team built around Pachirisu, but rather a team that uses Pachirisu to fix matchups. VGC 2014 was a regional dex format, meaning that not every Pokemon was at the player's disposal in in the team building process. According to Seijin Park's team report, he actually chose Pachirisu because of its special bulk and access to follow me specifically. To quote the team report directly, in order to take advantage of Gyarados's power, I needed a Pokemon that had Rage Powder or follow me. 
In the past, I'd use Amoongus, but I ran into an issue. Zapdos and Ludicolo were really strong into this combination, so I decided to use Pachirisu instead. The Pokemon actually ended up being pretty good in the metagame, and Seijin Park was one of the first people to figure that out, so his call in the World Championships allowed him to succeed. Pachirisu had some underwhelming stats, but its special bulk isn't to be understated. Seijin's Pachirisu was able to be 3-hit KO'd after Citrus Berry by H Slash's Shadow Ball, and was even able to tank Double Edges from Mega Kang and Play Roughs from Mega Mawile. Volt Absorb allowed for it to redirect electric attacks into it from Zapdos and even heal from them, allowing Sajin Park's Mega Gyarados to attack unimpeded, and it running Follow Me instead of Rage Powder meant that it could redirect away Grass-type attacks from Ludicolo, where Amoongus would not be able to. Sajin was kind of a genius for this decision, and it certainly paid off. That being said, you can make just about any Pokemon work if you really want to. Sajin was just one of the first dudes to really make it work on the big stage, and that is a huge achievement on its own. Let's get these two in one go, because the Dynamax mechanic allowed for these dudes to be viable in VGC, and with them, Regidrago and Regilecki all being usable, every single Reggie became viable. Yep, every single one. Not forgetting anything. To be honest, Regirock was made viable due to Dynamax, but Registeel was actually a little bit different. Let's begin with Regirock. Regirock has one of the highest defense stats in the game at 200. Along with an HP stat of 80 and 100 special defense, it's super bulky. However, with a base 100 attack stat, it isn't very viable in VGC when you're forced to use physical rock moves, one of the most inconsistent typings due to their low accuracy. But Dynamax fixed this. Regirock was able to take full advantage of its massive bulk in combination with Dynamax to easily activate a weakness policy and start sweeping teams with plus two max rockfall and Max Quake. Max Quake even allowed for Regirock to shore up its average special defense stat due to giving it a boost every time it was used. The sand for Max Rockfall would not only break Sashes, but it could also give Regirock a 50% passive special defense boost on top of everything. The most common Intimidators in the game couldn't effectively deal with it either. Incineroar was weak to both rock and ground moves, and was actually unable to intimidate it anyways due to the ability Clear Body, which blocks all stat drops from opposing Pokemon. Regirock ended up seeing some pretty decently high usage in Series 9 VGC due to all of this. Registeel, on the other hand, was, was actually more viable due to the access it had to the at the time new move of Body Press. This is an 80 base power fighting move which allows for the Pokemon to attack with its defense stat instead of its attack stat. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Registeel would invest EVs into its HP and special defense stat to make sure KOing it on that front would be a struggle. Then by using iron defense, it could not only become nearly indestructible on the physical side of things, but begin taking KOs with a Body Press coming off of a possible 684 defense stat. While it would typically be walled by ghost types, it almost always had partners that could easily deal with them to set up a win condition for the Registeel. Another Steel type that got really good in Generation 8 specifically is actually Durant, but you should just check out my video on that after this one for that info. I'm not about to make my editor make the same video twice. Chat, 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 is this real? Chat, there's a bird and it's good, chat. Chat, is Murkrow like good? Yeah, in, in Generation 9, Murkrow was like top 5 in usage for a while. This is because it was the only prankster tailwind user in the game, along with a few other traits. Now, in Crobat's section of the video, I mentioned dynamic speed mechanics, but didn't elaborate on them. That's called foreshadowing, or poor script writing. I'm gonna go with the first one though. Anyways, dynamic speed was introduced into Generation 8. This meant that speed tiers were calculated between each Pokemon's move instead of between each turn. So, if you tailwinded in Generation 7 or before, you wouldn't benefit until the next turn, but as a Generation 8, you got the speed boost instantly. Murkrow being a dark type meant it was immune to prankster taunt and could even tear a ghost to block a fake out, nearly guaranteeing a turn 1 tailwind for its partners. Beyond that, Murkrow also had access to Prankster Haze, allowing it to be a hard counter to all setup Pokemon, or more specifically, Dondozo. See, Dondozo was a top tier Pokemon at the time, and it still is, but Dondozo would gain an Omni boost to plus 2 in all of its stats if paired with Commander Tatsugiri, but Murkrow could easily reset that and leave Dondozo stuck as a mediocre Pokemon in a 2v1. This niche allowed for Murkrow to rise to the top of usage and arguably become the best Pokemon in Series 1 of 2023 VGC. And and it remained relevant up until Tornadus overtook it in Regulation D. But Tornadus' existence will actually bring about another Pokemon's rise, which we'll get to just after we talk about Articuno has never been a solid Pokemon in VGC. To be honest, it's never really been a solid Pokemon anywhere. Being a flying and ice type in a format where Scarf Rock Slide is one of the most iconic things in the game isn't really a good thing. But despite all this, Articuno managed to find a niche in Regulation D of VGC 2023. With Generation 9, Game Freak changed the weather condition of Hail to Snow. Instead of dealing damage at the end of each turn, ice types would now gain a passive 50% boost to their defense stats. Now, a defensive ice flying type still is a pretty bad combination, but Articuno managed to make it work because of one thing. 
thing. Articuno's hidden ability is Snow Cloak, which boosts its evasion by 25% when snow is active. By combining Snow Cloak with a Bright Powder, Articuno was able to passively boost its evasion to dodge a ton of moves and make it a nuisance to hit. This made it so moves with 100 accuracy had about a 67% chance to hit the Articuno, and if you're a Pokemon player, you know that if it's not 100%, it's like 50%. This passive boost made the less accurate moves nearly impossible to land on Articuno. Rock Slide is now a 60 accuracy move, and Wild Bolt Storm became 54%, and that defensive boost also made it so that if Articuno was actually struck by an attack, it had much more wiggle room to survive and then spam Blizzard in return, Blizzard of course having 100% accuracy in the snow. That Blizzard spam next to Obama Snow was deadly as they were also playing the RNG game offensively. The odds of at least one of the two opponent's Pokemon getting frozen by a single Blizzard is around 19%. Spamming that with two Pokemon each game, you're likely to get at least one freeze on a Pokemon, basically instantly guaranteeing their demise. So after years of irrelevancy, Articuno finally found its niche in competitive VGC, even if it is a little bit annoying. Also, Terra let it become a water type, which makes it so it doesn't drop to like every move in the game. We can't really understate that, but I just want to throw that at the end to make it seem like it wasn't just Terra that fixed it. The last Pokemon we're going to talk about today is going to be Bramblegast. Now, Bramblegast was actually one of the most unique and spherical Pokemon added to Generation 9. As a grass and ghost type, it had some pretty threatening offensive options. But what really made it stand out was its brand new ability in Wind Rider. Wind Rider made it so Bramblegast gains plus one attack if Tailwind is active and makes it immune to all wind-based moves, granting it an additional attack boost anytime it's targeted by one. Now, this might sound all very niche, and for a while it was. Bramblegast struggled to do anything from Regulation A all the way to Regulation C, but once Regulation D came around, it finally found its full potential. The genies in Gen 9 all gained access to a new move which became powerful offensive tools for them, being Wild Bolt Storm, Bleak Wind Storm, Springtide Storm, and Sandseer Storm. These Pokemon spamming these moves on offensive teams made it easy for Bramblegast to get a free switch in against Hyper Offense. But not only could it switch in on those, it could also switch in on Heat Wave, making it possibly wall out Choice Specs Chi Yu and take Heatran off guard then threaten a KO with a plus one Terra Ghost attack. This thing was even immune to Icy Wind, so it basically hard walled every Tornado set and could even find a turn to switch in versus Booster Energy Fluttermane. Its offensive stats allowed it to threaten Okos on tons of Pokemon including Fluttermane, Urshifu Water, Chen Pao, and basically anything that couldn't eat a plus one Terra Blast. It even started running Terra Steel with Strength Sap to annoy physical attackers like Terra Blast Landorus or Chen Pao while lowering their attack stats and healing it up. It finished at 13th of the 2023 World Championships on Emilio Forbes' team. Bramblegast went on a huge journey to competitive viability, and with it gaining Poltergeist via TM in the Teal Mask DLC, it has the potential to get even better. But but those are some unexpected top tiers in competitive Pokemon. Let me know what you thought about the video in the comment section down below, and let me know if I missed any Pokemon. It's support from you guys that keeps the channel running, so the best way to support me is to simply leave a like and subscribe. You can also check out my playlist full of more videos on the screen in a couple of seconds to let YouTube know that you're really into my content. And if you want to do even more, you can check out my Patreon page to see your name at the end screen for as low as $1 a month. For $5 a month or a YouTube membership, you'll also get access to my bonus videos where I build a team with top players to try to make bad Pokemon work. With that out of the way, thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.